So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Rayo. I'm chair of emergency medicine at Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center in West Islip, New York, and I am obviously going to take the con or anti-AI perspective. So to me, Shrikar is not really human. I mean, if you look at his publication record, something <laughs> is off with him. Um, and when we chose this topic, he seemed to jump out and want to take the pro-AI. So just keep that in the back of your minds when, when you're thinking about the arguments that he has made. So I, I thought that I needed to really go a little bit deeper with this talk. So I actually have some consulting experience with AI in the past. Um, I've read a lot of the literature. Uh, but knowing I was going up against Shrikar, I really thought I needed some, some stronger arguments. So I actually contacted all of the ultrasound vendors. Um, and I said, I want to talk to the head of your AI departments, and I want to find out what the real challenges are. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you guys is stuff that they actually brought to me. So we talked a little bit about this, and uh, Andrew Taylor yesterday did a great job. AI is sort of the umbrella term, then machine learning is a subset of that, and then deep learning uh, implements neural networks. But again, we're not going to go into too much detail about this. AI universe is very, very complex, and that's one of the issues uh, when it comes to point of care ultrasound. It's cost. So one of the vendors uh, told me that the individuals who are responsible for building AI within ultrasound are in serious, serious demand. So Google, Uber, Facebook is throwing boatloads of money at these people to come work with their companies. Um, and there's not that many of them out there, okay? So the expertise really isn't even there to promote this and actually um, integrate it into point of care ultrasound. Once you have that expertise, then there's a lot of computing power. So Shrikar talked about the big data. Um, so you need really powerful systems uh, with very high processing speeds to be able to do this. One of the gentlemen actually said to me, you know, Chris, th th these things aren't built in a garage. There's teams of people, um, very, very high paid people who have to be put together to do this, and you need networks of them. And once you have the expertise, then they have to partner with clinicians. Um, so it takes years and years to build these teams. Um, and often you have to be within the industry to actually be able to build these teams. And a lot of these individuals are not coming from this industry. So it's a huge, huge challenge for them to actually develop uh, these systems for us. And then research and testing is obviously still in the infancy stages. <laughs> Even across the AI world, there's no standards. There's no standard lingo. There's no standards on how the acquisition protocols work. So it's, it's actually all over the map with how people are, are developing these systems. It's inconsistent. So uh, same patient, same uh, person performing the ultrasound using the AI, you're going to get different results. Any of us who have tried the AI that's available now, I think we would all agree upon that. Never mind getting two different uh, sonographers using the AI, even on the same patient. The results are just all over the map. Um, this is an example of VFI, which is a, you know, a one button uh, touch. And you can see that the calipers are not even where they need to be uh, to, to acquire the, the actual measurement that we need. So, uh, for those of you, I don't know if you see any of the Michigan guys. So the Michigan uh, crew presented an abstract yesterday, which was great. And they showed uh, calipers being placed supposedly over the heart, but the heart wasn't even on the screen. And the machine actually read it as a good read. Um, so there's all sorts of inconsistencies when, when we're doing these things. It's user dependent. So you have to actually learn how to use the AI. But how are you going to teach somebody who doesn't know how to use the ultrasound machine then how to use a subset of that skill set? It's very, very difficult even if you know how to do ultrasound and you're an expert. Now we're talking about teaching novice people how to do something on a system that they don't know how to use. It just doesn't make sense. 
This is actually a, big, a bigger issue with radiologists, and there's a lot of publications from radiology. They're actually pretty concerned that it's going to um, diminish their utility and diminish their pay. Um, so probably not as big of an issue for us, um, but just something to keep in the back of your mind. It's very focused. So you're looking for one specific thing, typically with AI, and I think we run the risk of missing other things, other things that are going on during the ultrasound exam um, and potentially other pathology. Some of these companies think that they're going to get so good with this stuff that they're going to be able to have ultrasounds in the hands of everyone. So they think they're going to have people at home using it. It's going to show them how to get the image, and then they're going to make the diagnosis. So what are they going to do then? So, okay, I'm at home, now I have a diagnosis. Is that really what we want? Um, and then think about it. Think about your friends at home. <clears throat> so, I mean, I have some friends that I'm shocked they can hold down a job. Um, now we're going to give them ultrasound. And they're going to make these critical diagnoses. I'm just not sure that that's really where we want the medical profession to go right now. I'm shocked that uh, the uh, master god researcher <laughs> didn't actually put up a lot of research about this. Um, so despite all of his awards that we see here, um, you notice there wasn't any uh, convincing evidence-based approach to his debate. Um, and that's really because there's no evidence that any of this stuff really works. Inherent to AI is this learning pathway, right? So you have to keep going and going, and it's constantly learning and getting better and getting better, but the sensitivity and specificity never gets to 100%. So if we're talking about um, critical diagnoses, and I've heard it thrown around for cardiac motion, if it's not going to get to 100%, do we really want to rely on the computer to tell us whether or not the patient is alive or not? It analyzes what it's fed. So it's going to detect pa patterns and sort of learn or train as it goes, but it requires huge, huge data sets, okay? So likely not from one institution. So now you're talking about a lot of other issues when you're talking about shared data. There's privacy concerns, who owns the data. Uh, Andrew yesterday went into labeling of the data. We, not, we don't really label our data consistently. Um, and then there's storage. So you're going to need massive storage to actually collect all this data to make these systems run well. And then video adds even more uh, challenges. So very large files. The models become a lot more complex when you're talking about 3D. And then we all scan differently. So we've all had residents who are just whipping through a, a kidney or a fast exam and, you know, their, their hand speed is really quick. How is the system going to differentiate their scanning speed versus our scanning speed? There's a lot, a lot of issues related to that. The source of truth, if you read through the AI literature, is another concern. So who ultimately is saying what the right answer is? What's the gold standard? Um, and we would have to all agree upon that in order for these systems to actually correct themselves and, and work well. And then there's no deductive reasoning, there's no integration of prior imaging, there's no clinical information that comes into play with these systems. So at the core of point of care ultrasound is that we're at the bedside, we know the clinical scenario, we're talking to the patient, we're examining them as we're doing the ultrasound, that would all be gone if we're, if we're going to rely on, on AI and deep learning. Then there's the whole issue of patient populations. So do you need to have all females in one data set, all males in another? Then you have to have each, applica each clinical application. And then it probably an even bigger issue is if they're collecting their data are they collecting it on the obese patients that we're seeing in the ED every day, or is a lot of their info coming from the labs that they're working on with, you know, the trim and fit individuals, and is that how they're building their systems? Because as we know, our patients are very different than um, what they're testing their systems on. 
other industries. Srikar talked about the, the crashing self-driving cars. Those of you, I mean, I can't even get a vacuum to, to vacuum my pool or my house self-automated. Now I'm going to make a life-threatening diagnosis. And then there's video games, we'll t which we'll talk about. If you look at the literature in other industries, they all sort of say that they never really get to true AI, that they settle for sort of rules of thumb and they get just enough um, to get by, but is that really what we need for medicine? Probably not, right? We, need, we would need true AI uh, in order for these things to function. So those of you who play video games, I'm sure people play Madden, right? So that's like AI all over the place. Um, and those of you who play a lot, you know that there's glitches, right? Things happen that shouldn't really happen in real life. Certain plays will work every single time. Um, it's definitely gotten better over the years, um, but there's still problems. So if they can't perfect it over years just for a video game, how are we going to do this uh, in the medical profession? It might be a, another barrier to the physician-patient relationship, right? So we're, now we're going to be relying more and more on computers, not talking, examining our patients. One that I didn't think of and that was brought to me from the industry uh, is that there are huge regulatory barriers. So uh, they talked about Tesla and how uh, and they said in 2015 they said they were going to have a self-driving car. And now they're going through all these regulatory barriers. They got pushed step back to 2017, 2019. Now they're talking about 2022. So for ultrasounds, it's the same issue. Um, they said that for measurement uh, acquisition, it's not as big of an issue. But once we start to make a diagnosis with AI, is there are going to be huge, huge regulatory barriers. They're going to be very, very costly. They're going to require uh, clinical trials, and uh, they, they see that as maybe one of the biggest hurdles to developing these systems. What do you guys see here on your diagnosis? And this is going to be my final point. What's the diagnosis? <laughs> it's confirmed on this ultrasound. So does everybody see the turbulence up here? So I was presenting this at a national conference and one of the cardiologists like jumped out of his seat. He was like so excited. He said, this clinches the diagnosis of aortic dissection. He said, that there is the flap, um, actually intima, intima, intussusception, flipping back into the left ventricular outflow tract, and then you get that turbulence because the blood flow is getting bounced back. So has anybody seen that? No. So I've seen it once, um, right here. I didn't even know I saw it when I actually saw it, scanning it. But you know what? I'll never forget it. If I ever see it again, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to make the diagnosis. If you guys ever see it again, you guys will probably make the diagnosis. The problem with AI is you would need all of these variables, all of these very rare cases in the data set for it to work. Um, and that is unlikely, very unlikely to happen. You're unlikely to get a data set with all of the variables um, in it in order for the AI to be good enough for us to actually use. Um, humans, on the, other, on the other hand, are very, very good at one-shot learning. You saw that, you'll make the diagnosis the next time you see it. So, in a nutshell, um, a lot, a lot of issues, um, very costly, and it's going to take an awful lot of work if we're ever going to get AI to the point where I think it's going to be useful in the emergency department. <laughs> so thank you, and uh, please vote at, at CRA07 now that our debate is over, and then I'm going to hand it over to Al and Dan.